we'll start this lecture over. Week 10, day one. We'll talk today about story and level design. Let's talk about level design and story. Okay. So a lot of video games don't have stories. And, you know, sometimes it works. Like Pac-Man, like, I guess we know he's married to Miss Pac-Man. Or maybe she's just his sister because they both come from the Pac-Man family. But story is uh, one of those things that really can make or break a game. If you if you look at the um, you know your sort of all time favorite games, usually they're ones that have a really good story to them. Uh, not always. Gears of War is you know, kind of got a marginal story, but you know what does everybody remember about what was it Gears of War two when you find uh, Dom's wife Maria? You know, like everyone remembers that moment. That was a good piece of storytelling. Uh, Destiny story is kind of iffy. Yeah, it, it is. It is. Um, so what's the secret to writing a good story? First of all, iteration. <laughs> yeah. the, one, of the, one of the first things you have to do is you have to go over the story over and over again. And um, you have to come up with a theme. You have to come up with a mood. Um, you have to tie your color palette to it. If you don't know what a color palette is, it's when you get all of your artists together and you say, for this level... This is the colors we use, all right? This, for level two, these are your primary colors. Make them using this. And for level three, it's gonna be this. It's a sunset level. So these are the primary colors we're gonna be using. And then for this one, we're using this palette. And so colors and lighting and fog and story all influence each other and they all create mood. And, and the goal of a good story is to cause emotional highs and lows in your players. Okay, so if a game is only emotional highs and no emotional lows, then it's probably like a kid's game that's pretty bad, right? Where only good things happen and nothing bad happens is a pretty boring game, right? It's, this could be like Sunrise or something like that. These are beautiful palettes, by the way. And so when you're plotting out your game, you want to really be like, all right, what mood are we going for? Are we going for introspective, uh, over-the-top action, you know, what is it? And I think Unexpected Twists and Character Development also, yeah. yeah character Development's a really big one, and uh, it's it's not done enough with with most video games, because you're the character, right? And if, and how do you tell you that you're developing? It, it's been done. Can you guys think of any uh, video games where there have been good character developments? For most of your games, about neon rainbow colors, sure. So this game here looks like just a generic over-the-shoulder third-person shooter set in Dubai during a dust storm, basically. A lot of dust. Big dust storm. And it just looks like a generic, like, when it came out, nobody, like, really paid much attention to it because it just looks like your generic cover shooter kind of game, like Gears of War, but just not as good. And then people played it, and they're like, oh, damn. That is, yeah, that's a game. And it's the story. It's the story of Spec Ops the Lion that sets it apart. It is not the gameplay. The gameplay is very generic. You've got a gun and you shoot while taking cover. Okay. There's a couple set pieces where you like have to fight a helicopter or something. But it is, uh, it is not, it is not uh, a gameplay to write home about. Okay. What makes the game amazing is the mood that it creates and it starts off very generic just very like you're a soldier sent here to dubai it's been people in dubai have been trapped from dust storms uh we sent in the american army a while back and they didn't come out communications are impossible it's basically heart of darkness or apocalypse now but set in dubai instead of in uh, southeast asia or africa for heart of darkness the conrad um and you play it, and, and that's why a lot of people wrote off the game. It starts off just very generic. And after a while, it's just like, hmm, this is, hmm. You know, like, they, they got some Vietnam-era sounding music going on. Um, the Americans are attacking you now. You're like, wait, what? Like, these people that I was sitting here to, like, I'm an American too, you know? And, and like, the Americans are shooting at me, and I'm putting bullets in the head of American soldiers, and... Like, wait, what? You know, what's happening here? 
you know, and it just gets darker and darker and darker. And the game's cutscenes, originally the cutscenes have like a, a thing and it has like a little text at the bottom and the text at the bottom says, you know, press E to take cover, you know, like little tooltips, you know, hit F7 to quick save. By the end of the game, you're doing some really horrible things as the player. And the cutscenes are like, do you feel like a hero now? <laughs> like, it is just straight up dark, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't want to ruin it for you, but your character starts committing war crimes, you know? And, uh, and he's sort of forced into it, you, you know, by, by the situation. He's sort of forced into it, but he's still committing war crimes and innocents are dying because of him. And by the end of the game, you're just like, what the hell just happened? It's a game with a fantastic story. And uh, not a lot of people played it because it just seemed like a Gears of War game, but worse. But the story really sold that game. Uh, it's a little quirky. Uh, it's not eh, It's not quirky. It's um, dark and disturbing is the best way of putting it. And so the, the color palette for the game really reflects. It's, it's, it's your typical Middle Eastern game uh, palette, you know. Where every time Hollywood or video games do games set in the Middle East, it's always like browns and whites, you know, for whatever reason. It sort of neglects what it actually looks like. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so Spec Ops The Line is all browns and whites, but, right, you can see the color palette here, right? Like, what colors do they use? And, uh, And then the music is also a big part of it, too. And so a good story, character development, yeah. Um, unexpected twists, yeah, definitely. Uh, but what I was saying is that this is actually a game where it does character development really well. Because your character starts off as a idealistic, you know, American soldier sent to save people that are trapped in Dubai. And then it just gets worse from there. What I would say is a key element of story is is spacing out the emotional beats. There's upbeats and there's downbeats. And uh, one of my favorite authors by the name of Robin Laws, maybe Robin D. Laws even, who is one of my favorite authors, he wrote a book called Beating the Game, I think, or Beating... What do you call it? It's written a lot of stuff, huh? Uh, beating the story, maybe. Beating the story, yeah. And so this is actually a really, really good book as far as for how to pace narratives in games. He he comes from a role playing game background. He doesn't do video games, uh, but he he is a master of role playing games. And so he basically went through. Uh, several major works of literature and uh, like Hamlet and showed and broke it down. Oh no, the, no, maybe I'm thinking of Hamlet's hit points. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Hamlet's hit points. He goes through Hamlet and he, he talks about uh, different kinds of emotional beats that you have in, in any game or movie or, or play or whatever. And he breaks it down and he, and he, he basically... He basically rewrites Hamlet as a role-playing game. Like Hamlet makes a spot check. Aha! You detected somebody behind the curtain. Stab. I got you, you villain. Oh, shoot. That was not who I thought was back there. Dead. You know? Committing war crimes is your favorite. <laughs> and so uh, a game, a movie, a play has to mix together upbeats and downbeats. You have to create those senses of hope. Like, oh, we might be able to get out of here and escape Dubai and then come crashing down later. Like oh, the plan that we, that was sent to get us crashed. Uh, Subnautica does that, right? Subnautica about halfway through Subnautica, uh, you, you radio a, a spit, you've crashed on an alien planet. You build a radio, you radio a, a, a nearby spaceship. They come to get you and they get blown out of the sky by the same laser that blew your ship out of the sky. And so there's this moment of like, Hey, we're coming to get you. Get the McDonald's ready, you know, and then you're like, psh, 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 and then there's this huge emotional downbeat 
I'm like, oh dang, not only can I not get rescued, but nobody can rescue me because there's this giant space laser that will just take out anybody that comes nearby. So yeah, I would, I would highly recommend if you're into story, like if you actually want to get into story, uh, these two books are like really, really good. And they didn't get much traction. It looks like 11 ratings on Amazon, 71 for Hamlet's hit points. Uh, but they're, they're, they're really good. And when you're writing your own story for a game, think about that. Think about the pacing of the story. You don't have a, a great victory and then another great victory immediately following it, right? You need, you know, you can think about a five act structure, like a lot of role-playing games, like you played a uh, Mass Effect, right? So Mass Effect follows the sort of five act structure of, of plays. You know, you have your prologue and there's usually some big cut scene at the beginning where it's like, welcome to the, you know, Normandy. And then there'll be like some initial challenge. And then when you accomplish that, then it dumps you into the open world. And then um, I think Mass Effect 3 opens on Earth, right? And you, there's a little, little quarter shooter thing at the beginning of Mass Effect 3. Is that right? You guys remember the beginning of Mass Effect 3? Yeah, he's like on Earth, I think. Is that right? And you, you and uh, what's his face go running around together. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. And then uh, it winds towards this big climax. And then after the climax is over, there's a denouement. And uh, and then you pick which of the three endings you want, red, green, or blue. This is the dumbest thing ever. So yeah, a lot of a lot of role-playing games are structured like a play. And so a lot of the, the techniques that people have developed over the thousands of years of maintaining dramatic tension in a play or in a movie applies to a game as well. But the trouble is you can't shoehorn a player into doing what you want, right? In a play, you know that Hamlet's always gonna stab, you know, what's his face, Laertes or whatever. Who's he stab? Claudius, that's right, Claudius. Polonius, Polonius. That's right, Hamlet stabs Polonius hiding behind it. So what you want to do is yank people's emotions up and then you want to yank them down and you want to yank them up and then you want to yank them down. Okay. You always want change in their emotions and sometimes you yank them up twice and then yank them down a lot or yank them down a little and then yank them up, up. you know, it's, it's those emotional beats that create really good stories. It's like I'm playing uh, Pathfinder Wrath, Wrath of the Righteous right now. The game starts off on a massive downbeat. You're in a town. The town is the front line of defense against the world wound. The world wound is this open, essentially, pit to hell. Demons pour out of it. Uh, the world wound has been surrounded by a series of fortresses. You're in the main fortress that has a magical effect containing the world wound, keeping it from spreading. And the city falls immediately. You get there, and within, like, it's like, talk to the, go have fun at the festival. Within, like, 30 seconds... A giant demon lord appears, splits the city open, kills everybody. You fall into the pit. Um, congratulations, Canaveros has fallen. You know, and you're in a pit with like a you know a friend with a broken leg and nothing to do. So, uh, it so Wrath of the Righteous starts on a massive downbeat, and so after a giant downbeat like that, you can't just have another downbeat. So they have a couple upbeats. Like you discover, like the next major plot point is you discover. A dead angel. Sounds like a dead beat, a downbeat. But the angel gifts you the gift of the heavens, and you gain the ability to manifest a radiant cloud or a sword and all this kind of stuff. Like, oh my gosh, I'm now super Superman or something. You know, you gain the ability to like do miracles, and, and that's a massive upbeat. And then you go into a, a thing, and then one of your two companions you had betrays you. You're like, ah, oh, massive downbeat. And it turns out she's been betraying all of the people all along and turning people into cannibal demons. Oh, massive downbeat. But then you kill the demon that's doing all that. Oh, upbeat. And then you get back into the town uh, and, and realize that not everyone said, oh, upbeat. And then you go out there and fight the demon that's behind it all. Let's do this. And she creams you, massive downbeat. And it just sits there and goes up and down, up and down. And um, yeah, and that's what makes her good storytelling for memorable storytelling. 
Um, you never played uh, Mass Effect. Yeah, creams you. Yeah, she did, she paid like like I did really well, and it's like when you're at level two or whatever, like you cannot take fireballs. <laughs> and so she sits there and fireballs you over and over again until you die. Like there's basically nothing you can do about it. I'd be interested to know if you can actually defeat her early on, because she is a high-level monster, you're level 2, and I, I don't see any way of surviving that, but, yeah. So, yeah, so, story ties in with your color palette, ties in with your lighting choices, ties in with your fog, ties in with the materials you have, like, this shiny pink material I have here would not work very well in Spec Ops The Line, you know what I mean? You just win. And so thinking about emotion and things like that is, is really important. So what I'd like for you to do for Thursday, so I'd like for you to write just a little, little short story, like laying out, not even a short story, just like lay out the plot of like a role playing game or something like that, you know, uh, not an action game. Action games, oftentimes you can kind of go light on the story. Halo, actually Halo is a pretty good story, I think, right? Um, kind of. Kind of runs off the rails a little bit, but kind of is a good story. You already made one? All right, cool. And then just submit it. So one page essay. Basically, I want you to have, and I want you to, uh, I want you to mark them with upbeats and downbeats. I want you to mark um, when it should make a player feel happy. I want you to make them feel sad. Just jerk on that chain. Just jerk on that chain, you know? Like Last of Us, right? Like think about these games that really make an impression on us. Red Dead Redemption, Red Dead Redemption Two, Red 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 Red, 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 Red Dead Redemption One ends with Marston getting his family back. Right, he gets his boy and goes hunting with his boy. Massive, massive upbeat, right? You get to go hunting, hunting with your boy, and against all odds, they're not dead. You know, and you get to have a good relationship. And when that happened, I'm like, oh, Lord, they're going to kill him. They're going to kill him, aren't they? And so I went online, and I'm like, what happens to Marston at the end of Red Dead Redemption? And they're like, he dies. And I was like, mm, nope. So I just turned off the game. I actually, <laughs> actually didn't finish it because uh, I knew that there was this massive downbeat coming, and I just didn't want to experience it because it was the end of the game anyway. So I never got the achievement for finishing Red Dead Redemption for that reason. Um but I want you to lay out the upbeats and the downbeats. Okay. All right. So that's story. Let's talk about level design. So what I have here is a tech demo. This is not a level for a video game, right? It's just, I put a bunch of things on a stage and this thing here is from the original third person template. And I just left it there because it allows you to show pathing and stuff like that. All this stuff. It's just a tech demo. This is not good level design. So let's talk about level design in the, in the last 14 minutes of class. Because you can get a job as a video game level designer. Okay. Thought New Vegas is all highs and no lows. No, I don't know about that. <laughs> Thought New Vegas starts with you getting shot in the head and betrayed. That's a pretty big down, downbeat. And then uh, occasionally you go into like the Caesar's Legion, you know, encounters. And those are, those are pretty gruesome sometimes. Um, so let's talk about level design. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Steph, have you, uh, do you have any interest in, uh, making video game levels as a career? Oh, Steph's still here. But, um, there's, that's a whole, that's a whole career, that's a whole, um, field that you can get into. And, uh, and so let me, let me talk about a little bit of it. So, if you're doing, like... Let's say you're doing like a first person shooter, like a capture the flag type level. So what you what you want is you don't want a world like this. If there's like a flag over here and a flag over there. Actually, you know, maybe this would actually work. Uh, hmm. cool. Let's say that's the flag over here. You could defend it maybe. Come on, frame rate, catch up. There you go. Yeah. It's actually maybe not the worst design in the world. It's a little big. It's pretty wide, pretty open, pretty exposed. And so the, your level design is going to be based in part on the weapons you have, right? So if you have sniper rifles, 
and I'm trying to walk from my flag over here and the other flags let's say over in the castle over there I'll increase the camera speed so. Too fast, maybe. So let's say there's one flag in here and then one flag over here. Okay. If I were to have a game with sniper rifles, this would be a really terrible map design because all you would need is a bunch of people with sniper rifles kind of prone, laying on the hillside here, and they could literally snipe every person who was dumb enough to walk across the world this way, right? Okay, so what do you do if you've, got, if you've got a world with sniper rifles? How do you build your world? How does the world change? You know, if you didn't, if this was like a medieval game, right, or even what I have right now with these cats, you know, it's not like... It's not even like it's that big a deal because these things aren't too fast, right? How would you change how would you change the level? How'd you change a level? What is a level? Okay, so a level is a map, right? So we've got here um, some lakes, some hills, a castle. This is the level. So how do you how do you design it? How do you how do you make it work? What's the secret to making a level like this work? Hmm? It depends on it depends on what your game is. Like what what kind of what kind of weapons do you have in your game? What kind of, what's the story of the game? Is this going to work for a team versus team capture the flag? I don't know. It depends on your weapons. But Let's say that it is this game where all you've got is a confetti ball launcher, which looks like this. So maybe if somebody's walking over there, you can pitch confetti balls at them and kill them, maybe. And you can sprint, and you got a cat, and then the cats can walk onto people like that. Okay. In that case, is this map good design? Probably not, because uh, if some like you see these goblins trying to walk towards me over here with my hit scan targeting system, I can just basically obliterate anybody from any distance. Okay, so probably not good at game design. So what do you do? What do you do if you have sniper rifles? What do you do if you have hit scan weapons? Hit scan weapons are really good at killing people out in the open, right? Because all you have to do is move your mouse over them and click, and they take damage. So what map designers do is they'll add obstacles, they'll add things that break up line of sight, they'll add tunnels, they'll add covered sheds, like a covered bridge, that kind of thing. Define a range, yeah, a range would work too, and Overwatch does that a lot. They have fall off on the bullets, so even though you could hit scan, click on somebody and do damage with them, if they're far away, your revolver isn't doing much damage to them. So... Um, so it's a giant big question of how you make a good map. And the first thing you have to ask is what are the weapons? You know, like what what is what is the game? Because you can't just make a generic level and have it work for every game. It depends on what kind of weapons you have and what the is it capture the flag? Is it free for all shoot 'em up? If it's a free for all shooter, then this map might be too big for it. You know, if it's like a two v two shooter, this map might be so large that you could just be like running around and like just not seeing anybody to kill, you know? And so you have to ask how many players are gonna be in the game, all this kind of stuff. And so once you get all of your parameters down, then you can start designing your level. And what you wanna think about first when you make a level is the flow. What is the direction that players are gonna take through the level, okay? So where are they, where are they spawning? Where are they going to? When they go there, what do they do? You know, so if, if, for example, our game involved a uh, capture the flag where you had to walk over here and pick up a flag, which I have as a snowman, and you had to walk it back over here to the castle to capture it, and you had to do that over and over again, then the main flow through this map is going to be up this little spit of land right here. This is where most of the people are going to be on it. Okay. So you have to then think about 
okay, if we have two teams, let's say it's two team capture the flag, they're both going to be traveling in opposite directions down this little spit of land right here. They're going to be fighting each other. Is there enough terrain to make it interesting? Because terrain makes combat interesting. Interesting. If you have a giant blank plane, it's a very boring combat. And so we've got a little bit of cliffs over here that people could hide behind. Uh, you could probably use some blocking walls and structures and things like that to break it up a little bit. So the main flow in this level would be between that point there and this point here. Okay. Now, second question, choke points. So a choke point is a place that all the players have to pass through. For example, if you wanted to get into the uh, flag room over here on the castle, all of them are going to have to pass through this doorway right here. That's a choke point, unless you got flight or something like that, which we don't. And this door takes like two seconds to open. So that's a heck of a that's a heck of a choke point. You have to stand there for two seconds and not die while while these fools are coming after you, right? That's a choke point. Every person is going to have to pass through that doorway right there. And so all the defenders have to do is just sit here like this. And just every time the door opens, just spam the doorway, right? So that's a choke point. So you have to think about these things. When you're making a map, what's the, pr what's the point of the game? Let's say it's two team, capture the flag. What's the flow of the map? The flow of the map is going to be people are going to be moving along between these two bases back and forth. Is there a choke point in the level? Yeah, there's actually a couple choke points. There's this point right here, which is, you know, the main bit of land that people can go through. And then there is the doorway, which is going to be a severe choke point. And there's going to be this doorway here that they have to go in to get the flag. So we have kind of a minor choke point here, which is a nice broad spit of land, but still people are going to be going up and down it. We have a pretty severe choke point here. And then we have another one here. Now, what do choke points do? Are choke points helpful for the offense or for the defense? What do you think? Steph, Alexander. <laughs> having having this doorway here, which slowly opens over two seconds, do you think that's going to help the offense more or the defense more? <laughs> Guys still here? Yes. Having having a spot that every person has to go through, do you think that helps the offense, the people trying to capture the flag, or the people trying to defend the flag more? Defense, yeah. Because when you can force all the attackers to come in through one point, you can set up sentry guns, you can have your people with pipe bombs, you can have your people with rocket launchers, all of them trained on that point. All of their weapons pointed right at that point, all the offense has to come through there. And then people throw grenades and shoot rockets and fire their laser beams and all the sentry guns unload on it and the offense evaporates. Okay. Anytime you have a choke point, that's going to be a place where a defense will build up and fortify. Okay. And that's going to be the big place. The, the offense would probably kind of hover around outside of the castle until they got three or four people or something. And then they would try pushing in through it. And they would try running through the explosions and trying to get through and they would start spamming grenades, you know, just throwing them blindly, hoping to hit a sentry gun or something. And uh, that's where your gameplay is going to take place. Like a lot of your games gameplay is going to take place, take place centered on where the flow of people moving around on your map. And you know, you know what I mean by flow, right? Like just somebody, like if you trace, the motion of somebody in the game like they might run over this way or they might run over that way you think of it as like drops of water like moving through the the world where the flow comes together in one point and especially where the flow is going to connect with the flow of another team so this team's coming this way this team's coming this way that's where you're going to get gameplay that's where that's where most of your team's gameplay is going to take place it's where your game is going to take place there's going to be a bunch of people sitting behind a door waiting for people to come in. And then when the door opens, all hell breaks loose 
Either the offense wins, the defense wins, and you're going to reset and we're going to replay. Okay. If you're on a Halo-style map, uh, they have warthogs and, and various other vehicles that you can drive to go cross-country at higher speeds or flying or hovering craft and things like that to get across them at higher speeds. That changes the flow as well. Because you might notice that I've sort of neglected this area over here because you can technically walk, walk along it. And you kind of walk along this way as well. And uh, and these are these alternatives are actually important. These things are going to take a lot longer to walk along than the main spit of road. It's just further. But you can see that I've got it set up here where like if you walk along it, you can actually probably have some cover from the anybody shooting at you, right? Like you can walk along this thing and kind of stay hidden and like maybe make your way around the castle to the backside is much slower but you can get in from stealth and maybe you can make it up to the top here and then, then jump over you know and uh, and get in that way so anytime you have a choke point you have to think about alternatives to the choke point ways around the choke point okay so here jump and get in without going through the door right and have all those things be deliberate right so if, if there's a choke point, they're going to be fortifying heavily, then having an alternative to that choke point, at least to come in. Like if you jump in, you can get in around the choke point. You're still going to have to go out through it, but that's an alternative to it. So you have to think about your map in terms of like layout and flow, almost like you, you have uh, pipes of water. And if there's a place where it could be blocked by defense, have an alternative where you can go around. It's slower. It's going to take a lot longer to get all the way around this way. But it, if the choke point is very heavily defended, you could probably get around it and find an alternative way in. Does that make sense? So we're at four o'clock. We can pick this up on, on Thursday. But I, I, I do I level design is actually one of the big topics in the syllabus for this class. So I think I think we'll probably take a couple a couple lectures to talk about this um, going forward. But um, it, it, it's not something that can just exist on its own. You can't just have level design on its own. You have to know what kind of weapons are there. If there's sniper rifles, the, the maps must change if there's sniper rifles. If there's all projectile weapons, if there's homing projectile weapons, you need to have cover because these cats, these cats will absolutely wreck you. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter, right? Where you are that cat is going to hit you. You know what I mean? The only way you can get not hit by a cat is if you get behind a cover, right? And so if you have a game that has homing kittens like this, the only, the only way you can get around not having these cats wreck you is by being able to take cover. And so if that's one of the weapons in your game, watch me lock on that guy. See, the walls stop it. All of these things interact with each other. Okay. What are those green and purple lines uh, around the platform? The green and purple lines around the platform. Um, which green and purple lines? These lines here? Uh, I'm just visualizing the trace line. Here by the castle, you can see them. Oh, these? Yeah, those are just bounding volumes. So, um, yeah, in the in the editor, you can put out bounding volumes that do different things. I think that's a physics volume that I used. I could probably delete that actually. Uh, physics. I know it's. Um, yeah, there, there's there's just different ones. Um, there's like a. I have a light mass importance volume and a physics volume and a post processing. Maybe that's a post processing. No one's post-processing volume. Um, I don't think 
it does anything, actually. I'll probably just delete that. And we got that one. That one. Delete that one. Right. Let's make sure that we didn't break the water. I have a post processing volume underneath the water here, so if you go underneath, it turns all blue and stuff. So there I, I had one up I had one up top here just to show how you can do vignettes and things like that or mess with the field of view. So what happens stuff is that when you walk into that area, it turns on a special effect on the camera. So like you can um, have the field of view narrow and vignette so it becomes black at the edges of the screen. And um, so like I had it so just like when I walked up here, it just enabled film grain and some other stuff. I ended up doing all that stuff down here though. So you can see when I'm underwater, it's got film grain and uh, dang it, I'm too buoyant to go in. Uh, there we go, there's film grain. Uh, I don't think I've been yet turned on. I can probably turn vignette on. Uh, but yeah, you, you just basically drag an invisible box over an area. And then you'd be like, this area will, yeah, like um, post-process. So you drag out a post-process volume like that, and just do like that, like that, like that. That you can do, um, you can do volumes that like block people walking through it and stuff like that. It's like we can turn on bloom and so you turn on bloom, everything gets brighter. So that all the lights get brighter, and you do vignetting somewhere. So when I walk up there, you'll see the vignette, the vignette turn on. Oops, don't die for us. So you see how it vignettes, like the edges become dark. Okay. So yeah, you, you just can define a, you can define a bounding volume like that and then uh, have special effects be in there. You can have a damaging area so that when they're inside of there, they take damage. You can have, um, a physics volume so that when they walk in there, they're buoyant at swimming or flying or, or, uh, or stuff like that. There's, there's a lot of different volumes. Uh, I have a light mass importance volume in there as well. Can you make it nighttime? Yeah, you could. Um, sure. Um, in general though, the easier way of doing it is to just mess with the sun. So the sun can be, can be messed with. Uh, let's see where did my post process go. This one. Okay. So I can make it dark. Can I make it dark? Yes. Exposure. Too dark. Something like that. Not dark enough. See? It's like kind of cool, huh? Yeah, a lot of neat stuff. And the camera will sort of adjust as you go in there. See how it kinda like gets dimmer and then kinda it brightens. That's because it's got a this turned on, I think. So it'll sort of adjust your eye kind of to the to the region. Mm -hmm. A lot of cool stuff you can do with it. Anyhow, my goal, uh, and we're over time now, but my, my goal really is to get your skills to a level where you can get a job doing this. Oh, Aaron's here. And Mueller's here. Cool. Um, I This is the last semester of game development I teach. At some point, I might add a third semester game development. But, uh, you know, you're, it's going to be over in, in eight weeks. And so I, I want you to get to a level of competency 
where you can then apply to a game developer. And especially now that things are going online, you know, more and more. Like, it used to be you'd have to move to, like, you know, Texas or whatever. Nowadays, like, you know, you might be able to get a job, you know, remotely. Like, EA was hiring interns remotely all last year. Um, when you make buildings, you go inside. Do you teleport them to an area? Or do you have to set up the actual building to be an interior? You can do a map change. Um, or you can just have a different chunk of the map. And you can step on a thing and teleport to that spot. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also level streaming where you can load chunks of the world at a time. Stuff like that. Um, is that part of levels? Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, if you wanted to, like, work for Bethesda, then I suggest for your mod project, uh, mod Skyrim or something like that and get it get it get um experience with how the game toolkit works right uh you're working for mojang yeah uh, i mean good luck i mean everybody wants to work for them you know what i mean but like if you uh, if you get experience with a company's product and make mods that especially that people play then you know and you can demonstrate you've taken game development because <laughs> Uh, don't let me discourage you. Like, by all means, if you if you do cool mods, then, you know, apply to work for there. You know, why not? It's, um... The, the worst that can happen is they'll say no. It's not like they're going to sue you. You're such a bad applicant, we're going to file a lawsuit. No, no. The, the worst that will happen is that they, they, they just say no. That's it. You know? You, you, have to, you have to think about life in terms of, like, um... You know, risk versus reward, right? And applying for a job is pretty low risk you know it, it, the, the only cost is your time to do the application you know a friend of mine was one of the first modders for uh, Stardew Valley I think I brought him in a while back Josh Navarro former student of mine he was one of the first modders for Stardew Valley and he applied to get a job at the Stardew Valley guy he didn't get it so there you go you're no worse off than you were before you know what I mean but once you get your first job Getting used to hearing no makes it less scary also. Yeah. It's like, I, you know, even though I teach game development, I would not expect to hear back from most companies. I would love to work for Paradox. You know, I've been to, I've been to almost to their front door in Stockholm. I was like a quarter mile away from them. And it's beautiful. And I was like, damn, I, I, I kind of want to work for, for, you know, Paradox now. You know, this is an amazing place. Um, in the summer, at least. I wouldn't expect to hear back from them. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's, it's just a lot of people want to work in game development. But what my goal is for this class is to get all of you competitive. You know, I want you to have something under, something under your your uh, your name. You know, like if you if you're interested in doing level design, I want you to actually spend a while putting a map together. You know, maybe for a first person shooter, maybe for a role playing game. You know what I mean? Um, and in all these games, all these genres have different needs for the map development. Um, perfectly fine with 40,000 years in indie dev. Yeah, especially if they let you work from home, right? Because now that there's a pandemic, you know, you can, you can work from home in a lot of cases. You don't have to move. One of the downsides to Fresno has historically been there's just no, <laughs> you know, no jobs here, right? And that's a bit of an exaggeration, but... Um, you know, you can now get a job for Facebook and work in Fresno. So, uh, Amazon's hiring people for their game studios. Amazon's got money to burn. Yeah. You know? Well, you, you don't have to do a sad face. It's good right now because you can get a job for Facebook and Facebook's allowing people to work remotely permanently. You know, not like Facebook's <laughs> a company I'd want to work for, you know, like, um, I'm actually saying the news is very good right now. The pandemic is very good for like people living and working in Fresno. So my goal is to get you guys portfolioed up so you can, you can show off your work and show it to potential employers. Say, look what I can do. Okay. Bungie's the only one you want to work for. Yeah. You can't, you can't just be like a uh, fixated on one company. That, that's actually a, a strategy for failure. Right, you don't want to. You don't want to just be like the only company I want to work for is Bungie because, and then they don't hire you, and you're like all sad. 
you know, instead you want to, you want to set yourself up with like, uh, you know, I want to get a job in the games industry, right? That's got in his game testers. Yeah, you could, you could QA, you know, is, isn't in, you know, if you like, if you just like want to work for the company, it's an in how often you can transition into development depends on the company. But uh, QA, QA, you can, you know, you can try it. Why not? Okay. So, uh, Aaron, uh, we're, we're basically wrapping up for today. The, the point is, is we're going to be talking about uh, story. And we're going to be talking about uh, level design for the next couple lectures because that is on, on our syllabus. So your, your homework assignment for Thursday is just write a little one-page story that just has upbeats and downbeats. So sketch out the story for like a role-playing game or something like that. Because uh, role-playing games, oftentimes you can script a story. You know, you, at this point, Eris dies. You know, and um, yeah, your Destiny fan fiction. Uh, <laughs> um, hopefully, it's not slash fic or something. Um, <laughs> uh, so, mood, emotion, all these things make for good games, and level design is going to tie into it. And we're gonna we're gonna talk we're gonna talk about that more over the next couple next couple classes. Okay. You guys cool? Awesome. All right. I'll see you guys then.